Someone in my life that I would consider a peacemaker is a friend of mine named Peter Gibson. He is uh, from Northern Ireland, and just the way that he approaches his day-to-day -day life, he has this kind of just general underlying peace to him. I remember sitting with him uh, at a table and we're having lunch, and if there's an awkward silence, I'll, I feel like I need to fill it. And uh, I almost got a sense that maybe he was mad at me or something, and I slowly started to realize that that's just kind of how he lives in this peaceful silence and appreciation of someone's presence. And I think I wanted take more of that in my life, the kind of peace that he approaches the day-to-day -day with, that he's not necessarily looking to get somewhere or go somewhere, but he's just content being in the presence of uh, his friends and the people that he loves, and that's kind of, yeah, that's what I really appreciate about him as a peacemaker. Last summer, I was having some issues with someone that we were working with, and I remember going to him with the issue, and he just really was great at putting things into perspective for me and taking the time to really encourage me that in maybe the frustration that I was feeling was warranted, but also recognizing kind of the context that we were in and also just helping me to think clearly in so that he wasn't inciting anything or trying to rile me up to get even more angry and more upset, but was rather just kind of putting things into perspective and calming me down and maybe approaching it with more of a peaceful attitude. I think a lot of the time when we think about peace, we think about maybe it's just the absence of anger and frustration, and I think he's actually great at maybe recognizing the frustration, not kind of putting that aside, but also helping me see maybe the full picture, helping me see maybe the potential repercussions of approaching it in a more angry or frustrated way, and also seeing, helping me see the fruit of maybe just approaching it with more of a peaceful mindset, kind of as like what Jesus modeled, turning the other cheek and, uh, and still loving your enemies, I think. That's something that um, he kind of modeled for me and helped me see and something I want to continue living out in my day to day. Back in college at the end of the, the semester, uh, we had this project where we were supposed to meet with the teacher to like get feedback on it. And as we were having this interview with the teacher, the more questions that we asked, and it was just perfectly mundane questions about, you know, why did you mark us this way? Or why did you do this? But as we kept asking these questions, this teacher just kept getting more and more agitated as if we were insulting her in some way, despite the fact that we're just asking questions about our assignment. And so eventually it just started to reach a point where I was like, this is kind of escalating high enough that we could get ourselves into a serious situation here. So eventually I just I just started saying, oh, I, I get it now. And, and, and we just sort of just collectively as a group without talking to each other, just made the decision, let's just end this now before it gets out of control. I think there was value, even if I didn't do it at the time, in just recognizing that um, we don't really know what was going on in this in this teacher's life. Like maybe there was a family crisis, maybe she was just under an incredible amount of stress. You know, there, there could have been any number of reasons why that situation happening the way it did was understandable and even relatable to a certain extent. And it's, it really wasn't worth getting involved in that fight at all. Instead, it was it was better just to to just settle things amicably without uh, you know without starting something that you didn't need. Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Meeting House live stream. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here at the Meeting House. It is so good to be together today. Really, it's really, really good. Well, and I just want to say, if you are here with me, way to go. Um, I don't know where you are experiencing this from, where you're participating from, but where I am in Southern Ontario, it is cold winter February. The first Sunday of February is so hard. Um, we have experienced some real snowy, cold conditions recently, and that can feel so lonely, so isolating. And so I just wanna say, if that is the season that you find yourself in, let me remind you of these words. Can I just read this um, verse that's been encouraging me uh, this week? This is from Romans. Um, he writes here in, in um, chapter 8, verse 38, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing that can separate us. And so if you are feeling um, alone, if you are feeling separated, 
whether that's from God or from community or from relationships in your life, I just want to say, I just want to remind you that you are not alone, especially if you are watching this, if you are listening to this, we are together. This counts, this matters. And so way to go, way to take that first hard step. So yes, although February can be cold, and I know many of you are perhaps watching from warmer climates, way to go, you win, it is true. But if you are experiencing kind of those doldrums of winter right now, uh, know that you're not alone. And you took the first, uh, often hardest step, and you are here with community. And so I just want to welcome you. And I hope that you feel the warmth of Jesus this morning as we uh, spend time together. So there's lots going on today, things that I'm really excited um, to be chatting about with you and walking through with you together. First of all, this week was Lunar New Year. If you are celebrating Lunar New Year, um, Happy New Year. I'm so excited for you and um, I've spent many years celebrating that in past lives that I was in and that is often such a fun and celebratory season. So um, I, wish, I wish you all the best as you celebrate the Lunar New Year. Um, February also marks Black History Month for us here uh, in Canada. And so um, Black History Month is a time that we remember black history, where we celebrate black culture and where we acknowledge and uh, learn from the many amazing black leaders that have gone before us. And so um, I would just encourage you, I don't want this to be something that we just gloss over or something that you uh, don't hear. And I just want to pause here and and say to all of us, let's be intentional. Maybe this week, over the course of this month, let's learn um, from those who came before us. Let's learn about black history and black culture and celebrate um, with our brothers and sisters uh, who are celebrating black history uh, this month. Uh, today also marks the beginning of our new series. Um, today we are kicking off Eyes, Hearts, and Minds a deep dive into the book of Colossians, and I am so excited about this series. Danielle is gonna be kicking things off for us, and we um, are gonna be welcomed by guests um, who are gonna be doing different creative expressions to engage all of our senses, and so that's gonna be happening over the number of weeks, and I'm so excited to kick that off this morning. I know Danielle's gonna be diving into that more later on, and that is something that I think is getting up for, I think is worth inviting our friends too. And so feel free to be sharing this, feel free to be talking about this in your uh, places of life where you find yourselves in. Now the other thing that we are leading towards, as you might know, Easter is coming, but before we get there, traditionally in the church calendar, we've talked about uh, something called Lent, which is a, a period of time uh, in preparation for Easter. Well, here at the Meeting House, we do something called the Month of Prayer. And if you've been a part of the Meeting House for a while, you will uh, remember, you will know that we've talked about this before, and we're doing this again. And I'm so excited to be doing the Month of Prayer. You can go to themeetinghouse.com slash prayer to register because for the month of prayer this year, uh, you're gonna be mailed something. You're gonna be mailed a little kit where you can participate uh, with. There's gonna be all sort of little pot, some seeds, some rope, uh, all sorts of tangible activities to help you focus your prayers, um, focus your time as you pray towards, uh, as we lead towards Easter. It's called the Road to Hope. It's gonna be tied in with the teaching series. I'm so excited about this upcoming season. Um, for the Meeting House, The Road to Hope. That's themeetinghouse.com slash prayer. Okay, another amazing thing that's happening right now is among our youth and our youth leaders. And to tell you a little bit about that or to show you a little bit about that, we've got a video. So let's throw to that now before I go on. I'm James. I'm Virginia. We're the Fletchers. We're small group leaders at the Meeting House Oakville. And during this season, we've been uh, able to stay in touch with our students um, remotely. But what we're doing right now is spending time going out to see each of them at their homes and doing porch visits just to let them know that during this tough time, we still think about them, we still pray for them, we still love them, and they're a part of our community. So we're doing that by showing them uh, ourselves present with them and then providing them a little gift on behalf of the youth group. It was great to see all the youth one-on-one -on -one, and we haven't seen them since last year. 
and we dropped off these gift bags and you know it has a pop a candy some chocolate bar and a fidget popper i think they're called and there's also a encouragement note that's already got a stamp on it so we encourage them to write a note to someone else in the youth group that they haven't seen in a while just note some encouragement and it'll be a surprise to get some snail mail in the mail we all experience really hard times in our life and it's at those times when you want to feel like you're part of community and the meeting house is that and the youth group is that and we're able to go around and visit our students and let them know that even in these hard times, they're loved, they're cared for, they're part of a bigger family that has their back. Amazing. I just love that story. How awesome is that? And hey, that is a great reminder. If you've got uh, someone youth aged in your life, perhaps who lives with you in your home, perhaps a uh, niece or nephew or someone in your life, why not head to themeetinghouse.com to check out what is happening in the youth here at The Meeting House. There are incredible ways of connecting, um, full of stories of leaders like that who are reaching out to their uh, small groups or to their youth groups to connect, to make sure um, that our youth feel a part of this community, right? It's not just adults who feel lonely and isolated during this season, but it's our youth as well. And that's why I love that these leaders are taking that time, those extra steps to connect with our youth, to see them, even if it means standing outside to give them a little uh, care package. And that's what's happening right now. And the incredible thing is all of this is possible through uh, your generous giving, through financial giving here at The Meeting House, yes, sometimes we think our giving goes to keeping the lights on or running the cameras, but more often than not, in fact, a vast majority of our giving goes to things like this, to these ministry needs, to providing tangible gifts to our youth and things like it. These are incredible stories of connection, of community, of um, being with people um, when they feel lonely, being with people, connecting in um, groups. And so I just love that. And so if you want to give, feel free to head to themeetinghouse.com slash give for more information to sign up to, to give financially. Okay, at this point, we are going to head to um, musical worship, and then we will kick off our teaching with Danielle. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your gift of life. Thank you that you are with us, that your love is so near. Jesus, I just pray for all of those who are listening right now, who might feel lonely, who might feel isolated, who are struggling in this season for whatever reason. I pray that um, the warmth of your Holy Spirit would fill their lives. Lord, that you would bring people into their lives that they can connect with, that they can um, experience you through. Jesus, and that you would remind us that um, we need to be connecting with our neighbors, our friends, those in our lives who might be lonely and isolated as well. Thank you, Jesus, for this space where we can come together and worship you and learn about you and participate in community. We lift uh, today up to you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to the Meeting House. We are so happy, so happy to have you here with us. We're going to enter into a time of musical worship. Feel free to stand and worship however you want. Um, and feel free to just, whatever you're feeling this morning, whatever you've walked in with, just give it to God. We invite you to come as you are and worship with us.
thinking about this next song. I'm going to read Romans 8, 26 and 27, where it says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. And I'm going to read it again, but this time the message version. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. And it just is such a comfort for me to think about the fact that sometimes I don't have the words. Sometimes I don't know what to say. I feel like I'm praying the same things over and over. And it just gets exhausting and tiring. And it's hard to wait. 
and it's hard to sit in, in the uncomfortable and in the uncertain for so long. And so just thinking about that, the fact that the Spirit knows what I'm feeling, the Spirit knows what we're feeling, what we're going through, and we don't even have to have the words. It doesn't matter because God is with us and He knows us. He knows everything about us. He hears our prayers. He sees us and He is with us. And sometimes all I can say is, God, I need you. I just know I need you. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to pray for. I just need you. And sometimes my prayer is just, God. So as we sing this next song, I think of it as our, our wordless groans, our aching, aching groans.
how I long for heaven in a place called earth, where every son and daughter would know their worth. John Foreman. The role of the artist is exactly the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. James A. Baldwin. It's not easy to see something that's never been before. A good world. Daenerys Targaryen. I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Come further up. Come further in. The Unicorn. Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah, that's a fun quote package right there. Wow, welcome and glad to be here kicking off this Colossians season, season, episode one. You get this, I blame COVID for all this language. Okay, uh, but before we do that, I just want to give you a heads up. We will be uh, beginning a journey on March the 2nd, all the way through April 17th. So all the way through Easter together as a community called The Road to Hope. And there's all kinds of ways we're going to do a, a message series on that, but also there's a prayer guide and there's community prayer times and real emphasis on prayer to prepare us for the events of Easter. So you need to sign up for that early if you're going to join in that. So we just want to give you a heads out, a shout out, themeetinghouse.com slash prayer and be part of that. We really, well, we need, we need to pray. Am I right? Just to make it today, to quote MC Hammer. All right. Uh, Colossians, this is so, I am so excited about this season uh, and, and this series, this Colossians series. I want to introduce you to our artist, Paul McNard, who's with us here from Lynchburg, Virginia. Hi, Paul. Hey, Thank hey, Danielle. Hey, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much. Now, this is AKA, if you're, if you're on Instagram, you'll know Paul as the Sketchy Sermons handle, at Sketchy Sermons. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have this incredible ministry, this budding ministry of quoting people or, or, or doing the sketch art to kind of provoke people to think. Talk, talk me through how that began for you. Um, it actually began in church. So I used to find myself in sermons and whatnot, just kind of wandering and not, not paying attention to what was going on. So I started taking notes in church, but I used a, like a form of note taking called sketch noting which combines art and um, the, the actual content being presented and kind of putting it together into like this amalgamation. Um, and forever, I just kind of did it, you know, with my little notebook and I put it away. Uh, a couple of years ago, I started posting on Instagram um, and it started, you know, people started getting interested in what I was doing. Um, and it's kind of morphed into quotes. Uh, you know, I, I learned you, you really can't put a whole lot of content on Instagram. You kind of have to boil things down yeah. to, you know, yeah. to like one Bite main size. idea. Yeah. 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 So no, it's been a good way to grow my faith, to learn more about the, the people in the kingdom. And it's just, it's been a wonderful experience so far. I've really enjoyed it. Well, I've really enjoyed uh, witnessing your work on Instagram and so thrilled that you're here in person uh, on Zoom. So you're going to sketch for us this intro to Colossians as I'm talking. You're going to be sketching and uh, we'll be able to enjoy this together. And, you know, one of the reasons why uh, this whole series, we paired an artist with the message because Colossians particularly is a book that's filled with imagery. And it's an invitation. Uh, Paul is asking for the spirit to fill us with the uh, imagination and the capacity to open our eyes in new ways that we've never considered before. So I think that your gift uh, is helping us do that. So thanks for being part of this. And we're going to get to watch you work. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll thank check you in with for, you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we'll check in with you at the end. So everybody at Sketchy Sermons, if you want to see more of Paul. And then uh, when he's done, we'll have actually a sketch note a sermon outline for the rest of the series for Colossians. How exciting is that? That you could have and you could print if you want, if you're all old fashioned like that and you have a printer still um, or put on your desk stream or something where it can actually remind you of what it is that we're digging into. Because I think that this book, the preeminence of Jesus, what Paul is speaking and when Paul is speaking it and to whom Paul is speaking it is really going to matter in terms of how we find our orientation to follow Jesus in today's world. 
So let me kick, uh, let me kick this off with um, a time that I, I, a visit that I had that really rocked my world that might give us a little bit of an, uh, an insight into what, what Colossians, where Colossians was written and how. So this is uh, Vienna, Austria. This is St. Stephen's Cathedral. So if you Google this, you'll see that this is um, the number one tourist attraction in Vienna. I'm going to show you a picture of that. There it is. And then in, that's inside the cathedral. I was there 2018. It was an anniversary, 24-7 prayer gathering, and I was there to, to speak. It was my first sort of big cathedral gig. And, uh, you know, first Protestant woman let to speak in this cathedral. So it was a big deal. I was nervous. I, don't, I hardly even remember the night, actually. I was so nervous. Like, like you know, just sort of like, pinch me. Is this happening? But you'll see inside that cathedral, there's this picture. And this was what the theme sort of of the night was of this picture. I'm going to show you a close-up of uh, next. Is a picture of the crucified Christ. Now, why all of this uh, event came to my mind is because the night that we were there is called the Night of Mercy. And it was the anniversary of the St. Stephen's Cathedral calling a night of prayer on the, the day that the Nazi occupation of Austria happened. And one of the first things that happened when the Nazis took over Austria was they banned all public gatherings. And Cardinal Inzid, let me get this right, Cardinal Initzer, in October 9th, 1955, declared uh, a prayer meeting anyway. And so they all met, everyone streamed, all the people streamed for prayer, just a night of mercy, just asking God to intervene, to help. And actually that was the prayer meeting that actually sparked the Austrian resistance to the Nazi party. But what happened uh, was he stood on the stage, the cardinal, and he opened the prayer meeting with this line, we have only one Fuhrer and his name is Jesus. And you can imagine, you know, the, 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 what that might have sounded like in the context of this Nazi occupation, this empire coming through saying, this is our Fuhrer, hailing, you know, Hitler, all of those things. And the cardinal just saying in that language, using that terminology to say Jesus is the only Fuhrer. And what happened is a direct result of that prayer meeting, word got out and uh, the Nazis were released and they uh, took people to prison. They tried to kill the cardinal, but he escaped. And what happened was they damaged all, as much as they could. They tried to destroy the cathedral, which is really hard to destroy a cathedral made of stone, by the way. <laughs> but they tried. They started fires. And this picture of the cross, what's really interesting about it is this is the, uh, one of the artifacts that was saved. It wasn't uh, repaired. They left it damaged. And if you, it's hard to see in this picture, but what you can see, the body of Christ actually has the marks of the bayonets of the Nazi youth as they came. And what's really interesting about this picture to me is that they didn't, uh, they didn't hit around Jesus, they just actually pierced Jesus. And the church decided not to repair the photo, that they would leave it as it was, that the wounds of Christ are still, you know, Jesus is still able to receive all of the hatred, all of the visceral, all of the, the angst, all of the empire's desire to rage against Jesus, Jesus can still absorb. Because now Hitler's dead, but Jesus is still pure. And so on that stage, you know, the, the, many years ago, just sort of saying, like, look at this, he's still Lord. And what kind of a Lord is he? In, 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 that, in that same way as those Austrians would have heard that cardinal's message, there is only one Fuhrer and his name is Jesus, is a very similar way that the Colossians would have heard Paul's message in uh, Colossians chapter 1. So when you start to read this through, you start to hear uh, the words of Jesus. There is only, you know, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You know, th this is literally a direct refute to the claims of Caesar in the Roman Empire that would say Caesar is the image of God. And Paul would say, actually, there is one who is the image of the invisible God, and his name's Jesus. So there is this, you can feel this in the room, like you can feel when, they, when, when Paul's words were read out in the church of Colossae, there'd be this like, does he know what he's saying? You know, is, does he know what he's saying? And so what Paul's words are in the context of an empire, uh, the, the, uh, a domain of empire. Okay, so this is the context where that letter is. And this is really important to think through because um, even though sometimes we're tempted to think of Rome as a historical context, this idea of empire, I believe that empire is alive and well today and that all of us actually live in some form of empire. And we'll have a chat about that in a few minutes. But here's some four characteristics of empire that might help us um, 
figure out and maybe have a look at how empire, this idea of occupation or colonized even imagination, kind of works its way into the way that we live today too. And if we can figure that out, then the words of Paul in terms of the supremacy of Jesus will have more power. They'll have more power for us in terms of uh, finding our context in this story and what Paul and Jesus is inviting us to do as a result. So let's go through the four uh, characteristics of empire uh, pretty quickly here. Um, the first one is it's built on systemically centralized power. The second one is it's secured by socioeconomic and military structures of control. The third is that it's legitimized by powerful religious myths. And it is, fourth, sustained by captivating imagery that perpetuates a false portrait of the empire's attractiveness. Now, just, just stay, it's sustained by captivating imagery that perpetuates a false portrait of the empire's attractiveness. Isn't that interesting? So it's built on systemically centralized power. There's a hierarchy. Somebody's in, in control. They're dominating control. Secured by socioeconomic and military structures of control. Legitimated by powerful religious myths and sustained by captivating imagery. So this is true of Pax Romana. This is true of the empire of Rome. But it's also true of all dominant empires when you actually start thinking this through. Uh, for example, I was trying to figure out, like, how does empire enter into our lives? We're, we're in a democratic nation. We're not, like, we're not ruled by a total, totalitarian, you know, dictator who's, like, crucifying people and things like that. But maybe uh, in our time and in our context, one thing that I thought of, uh, and there's many things, but the global economy might be an empire that we're a part of where everything, the, the, the sort of the global economic realities of how we live have actually, you know, captivated our imaginations. So that, you know, ca uh, our measurements of success, for example, are wealth, right? Our measurement of happiness, we, we just keep thinking if we can accumulate more. Our, 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 well, what it is that we're being sold on a regular basis that we can buy happiness somehow. Even like the way that we measure businesses. I recently had a, a fantastic uh, podcast episodes coming out soon with Lindsay Colley who, who was saying, you know, like even the way we measure our businesses is bottom line about dollars. How much money is this business making? And that's how we decide whether or not that business is a success. And she said, what if there were other markers of success? What if success was how much good is this doing in the world? How is this impacting people for positive change? How is this taking care of people? Like, are there other ways of measurement? And you don't really realize how saturated you are in the dominant sort of empire of a global economy until you start realizing that your imagination, what you consider good, what you consider a break, what you consider valuable, what you consider success, what you want for your children are all dominated by that very thing. It's really fascinating. If you're finding this hard to understand here, check out this next image. Uh, you might need a break, even in, this, even in this context. Have a break, right? You need a break. That's what you need. That's what 3% of the richest people on the planet need a break because they're exhausted, uh, absolutely exhausted. And, and all of this, this is just one image, and I happen to know a little bit about the chocolate industry, but like this is true of all of the global economic industries of the world, you know, very, if you apply the Roman sort of Pax Romana, the four characteristics of empire to our global economy, you'll, you'll very quickly see its connection. Uh, it, here's how this break works for the rest of the world. Yeah, so that is a child cocoa uh, slave. He's been trafficked into the west coast of Africa uh, there are hundreds of thousands of cocoa slaves. 80% of the world's cocoa comes from the Ivory Coast, comes from the west coast of Africa. Hundreds of thousands of child slaves are picking those cocoa beans that produce the break that you need today. Okay? So that idea of like this empire, these religious myths, and then also these like great advertisements of your need for success and wealth and opulence and yes, even chocolate. I'm so sorry I had to raise that. You're all just like, man, right? Like chocolate, yes, even chocolate is perpetuated by actually an oppressive system that leaves out people. This is just empire thinking. 
And this is the kind of thinking, this is the kind of empire thinking that would have colonized the imaginations of uh, Colossae. This is what they're part of. And can I just say this right now, in case this sounds judgy, I don't want this to come across as judgy. What I do want it to come across as is provocative. I want it to provoke um, an awakening, right? And this is exactly, this is why Paul is subverting the language of empire. This is why he's saying Jesus is actually the sovereign one, the supreme one. And we're going to have a look at his words in Colossians 1. He's doing this to actually awaken people's imaginations that have actually been captivated by like the best thoughts we can think of. Even within the church, when we think of like a global economy being the measure, being our dreams, like, you know, we, we you know, our great idea of escape is like getting a, a luxurious holiday, Right. Even the way that we think about our future is dominated by this empire. And he's saying the same is true in that empire. And he wants to awaken us. This is why we've invited artists to be part of this, because artists tend to be able to evoke and provoke our imaginations to think differently about things we might have believed before. Um, So let's have a look at Colossians, shall we? This is what Paul is actually asking us to do. And I, I want to do this. This is Colossians chapter 1. And just before we get to that passage uh, that I'm going to show you on a slide here, this is Paul's prayer for the uh, Christians in Colossae. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will. I love this. Full knowledge of his will. And to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. And then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. And all the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better and better. Jesus operates, and this is, this is, I think, the central theme, and this is the kind of pillar that we want to hang on in terms of as we out Uh, as we keep looking through the book of Colossians, Jesus is the revelation that enables us to enter and live an alternative reality to empire. You have, Jesus is, so it is not enough, and I, I think this is really, really important. Jesus is the revelation that enables us to enter and live an alternative reality to empire, which is Jesus's good news is that we can live a new way. And we don't have to be stuck in these uh, oppressive systems or in this illusion of freedom and we're just sort of pretending to be fine when everything actually is not fine and satisfied with our lives being amazing and upwardly mobile while, you know, a vast majority of the world's uh, expe- at their expense or in their inc- exclusion. And Jesus is introducing and always has, even through his life, remember he stands up in the temple and he says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's, 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 he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. This is going to be, Mary announced it even before Jesus showed up and said, this is going to be upside down. This is going to be right side up. This is going to be a, an inversion of values and principles. But how are we going to do that? So when Paul's talking to the people in Colossae, he said, like, how are you going to do this? Live a different way. How are you going to provoke a different response? How are you going to reframe situations? How are your values and your, what you're even aiming for? How's your investments? How is your business? How are your relationships? How are the way that you're going to live in this empire world? How is it going to be transformed? Because it is not enough just to say it's wrong. Everyone can do that. That's, there's a whole move. This is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. And then we're all just sort of going, yeah, it's complicated. We're all benefiting from sort of the colonizing of empire. Absolutely we are. We're all embedded in this thing. I have breaks several times during the day in the Kit Kat reality, right? Like I'm eating the, and, and I'm, the clothes that I'm wearing, the, the, the things, the things I'm imagining, I've been, I have, I'm in the empire. Paul's not like you, 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 you're living outside of this empire. He's not asking you to become an Amish, you know, person, although maybe he is, I don't know. And if, if he is great, good, good for you. But it, he's not asking you to remove yourself. He's saying there's a power greater than empire that you can access that can dislodge you from this value system that can dislodge you and awaken your imagination so that you can live differently in the midst of it. 
This is what Paul is saying. You do not have to be dominated by fear. You do not have to participate in an empire that continues to exclude and oppress. You do not actually have to be even afraid of death itself. The ultimate authority is Jesus. And if Jesus is Lord, it means Caesar isn't Lord. If Jesus is Lord, it means the economy is not Lord. If Jesus is Lord, it means all of those other measures of success are not the boss of you. And it's that transformation, it's that it's that connection. This is why Paul prays that the eyes of our hearts would be, uh, would be reawakened, would be open to all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that we would know him who is the highest authority so that we wouldn't allow fear and conformity into the way the world works to dominate our lives. That in many, uh, in many ways that Christians themselves, when they're tapped into the lordship of Christ and who Jesus really are, are unplugged from the world system enough that their works of art we become the work of art that provokes people to think differently. We become the, the, those, those places that say, you know, we only have one leader and, and that leader is Jesus, right? We become those works, those imaginations. We become what Jesus would say, the salt and light of the world. So let's have a look at that Colossians passage where, where Paul very subversively and very obviously is trying to subvert the language of empire and use it for the glory of God. This is it, Colossians 1, 15. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth. This is important, just in case you think this is just a super, and I, I think a lot of Christians have thought that this is just a super spiritual view of Jesus. But this is Paul, things in heaven and on earth right? This is a very rooted and gritty passage of scripture, visible and invisible in all of the realms, all the things that you can see, whether thrones, you think he's talking about something specific there? That's what Caesar would have sat on, <laughs> right? Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. This is ultimate supreme authority of Jesus. He is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. And then let's keep reading. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn, firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. Now we're going to unpack this in the next couple of weeks. So we're going to talk about how Jesus did this, what the cross actually means and uh, how he did that. And then we're going to uh, follow through with like how we can be like Christ in the world and how we can operate, but totally compromised in so many ways, born into empire thinking, how we can actually be an alternative reality and live that alternative reality. So this is going to be so so excited. Everyone's like, yeah, great. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, let, let's just say, if the characteristics of empire, which I found this really helpful in my life, is just to kind of go, okay, what are the characteristics, the four characteristics of empire that are working in my life, that I can see I'm buying into, that are dominating my thoughts, that are, you know, that are directing my behaviors? What are those things? And what's really beautiful about this is when you look at the person of Jesus, the reason why it's good news that Jesus is the supreme ruler and not Caesar and not Hitler and not the global economy is that Jesus rules a different way. Okay, so this is a really, he's a different kind of ruler. He is not a totalitarian dictator who uses oppression and control and hierarchy and pushes down and does what he wants at the expense of other people. Jesus is demonstrating that the highest authority is the person of Christ and Christ is love. And the greatest act, of course, of Jesus that disarms all the powers and authorities is self-giving love on the cross. And we'll, we'll talk about that next week. But this is, the, this is important. And that the four points of empire get subverted by who Jesus is. And I want to just mention this really quick. So what is the way of Jesus? Jesus' sovereign power does this, which is the opposite of empire. He decentralizes power. In the kingdom of God and in the church, people... <laughs> have all the power, not the ruler. You remember this? And this, this addiction that we have to like, 
um, this addiction we have to sort of centers of power, right? Even all through the Old Testament, God's like, I don't need a king. It's a people that I'm looking for. They're like, we need a king. I don't need a box to live in. I don't want to be in a, we need a temple, right? Like I don't need, and we need this and we need that because we're addicted to this idea of empire. And Jesus is constantly decentering the empire saying, I want to do things a different way. This is so beautiful. So that's one. He decentralizes it. Do you remember Jesus does this? The Holy Spirit's going to come on all flesh, women, old people, young people, daughters and sons. The Holy Spirit is coming on everybody. Tongues of fire rests on everybody. Who gets the power in the kingdom of God? everybody. <laughs> it's a decentralized movement. As a matter of fact, it's so decentralized, it's been impossible over 2,000 years to, to, to cut off the head. <laughs> it just keeps growing because it's about the people. This is powerful. Two, it's empowering socioeconomic structures and liberating people from slavery. And this is true from the early acts, and it's true, hopefully, God help it to be true today, that it is a liberating movement that takes the least of these and puts them at the center. Here, it's a legitimated uh, by the fruit of the Spirit and the presence of Jesus. And this is later on in Colossians. We'll read this through. And for it's sustained by love. It's sustained by love. Okay, so what does this mean? If we're that representatives, we are Christ, we are in Christ, and Christ is in us, we become these living testimonies, these living witnesses, these pieces of art that actually are meant to dislodge colonized imaginations, to begin to actually think differently, dream differently, want different things, uh, declare success by different measurements, right? This is what success looks like in the kingdom of God, that we would serve one another, that we would include one another, that we would love one another, Another, that we would resist the empire and we would actually live a different way. And uh, here's just a couple of artists and a couple of artworks from around the world that have shown this to me in my own travels. So this first set of pictures is from the Bethlehem partition wall. So if you go to Israel and you go to the work, uh, to the place of Jesus, uh, Jesus's birth, you'll see that there is this massive concrete wall, a part, they call a partition wall, that separates the Palestinians from the Jews in uh, right through the center of Jesus' birthplace. It's absolutely fascinating. And when this wall was sort of announced as the strategy that was going to end a bunch of like billions of dollars were, was put towards it, Banksy showed up there and, uh, and he put some art, provocative art. So you'll see on the bottom there, there's a guy that's throwing, instead of a bomb, he's throwing a bouquet of flowers. And you see a little girl there that's floating over the wall with balloons. So this is subversive art, trying to get people to imagine what they think they know in a different way. Uh, above there, you can actually buy this. I have a friend who has this last time we were there. You can buy a nativity set that has Jesus and Mary and, uh, and uh, Joseph, and then a wall behind them. And on the other side of the wall are the three wise men and the shepherds, who, of course, are restricted because of this partition from entering into the place of Jesus' birth. And they're meant to be provocative images. It's an artistry that's dislodging what we think is a dominant understanding. And they're asking us to think differently. This is the power of art and the power of what Jesus can actually make our lives this provocative work of art. Here's another one. This is from uh, Minnesota. I was there just last uh, month or two months ago. So the bottom image is in Minnesota. This is the place where George Floyd was killed. And that imagery of his death and the memorial of that imagery, that's literally where he died. There's that I can't breathe mama, that cry that was felt around the world. This is Black History Month, by the way. So we really want to celebrate the witness of uh, black authors and writers and leaders who have been witnesses of this empire for so long, trying to help us reimagine a different world. And we just wanna honor them uh, and we will be doing that. But that's George Floyd. Here's what's interesting. The top picture is uh, George Floyd, I Can't Breathe from the wall in, in Bethlehem. Isn't that interesting? And we see that, these pictures of George Floyd that went all the way around the world, like in Syria, there was a Syrian wall that was just like decrepit wall and an artist put George Floyd's picture there because that phrase, I can't breathe, is this, this people who have been suffocated by empire saying, hey, I'm trying to breathe here. This is the context in which the Christians enter the scene, God help us with the power of the spirit and say, ah, Jesus breathes on you. I have been anointed by the Spirit of God to announce good news to the poor. This is, this is the work of, the, of Jesus in the world still. 
in the highest authority, the greatest power, the power that is above all other powers has, is Jesus's. And Jesus uses that power to bring freedom to everybody involved. Here's the last one I'm going to show you. These are two different images. This is when they announced uh, the wall, the, uh, the wall project in America, the southern border there. So that's Mexico and the U.S. And two artists from on each side of the border got together and did what they call a seesaw project. And the seesaw art uh, installation was literally, they got these big pink, see these big pink boards and they put them through and they made it into a playground. So they took this image of like exclusion and power and separation and made it into a place of play. This is the power <laughs> that not only art has, but this is the power of our lives as we dislocate from empire and re-enter the scene as image bearers of Jesus. And then the final one down there, since we started with the economy, I thought we'd end with it. This is from uh, what's called the yarn bombing movement. Has anyone heard of the yarn bombing movement? <laughs> this is so great. It's nicknamed Grandma's Graffiti. But what they do is they actually use uh, knitting. So that's a cro crochet pattern and someone has completely covered over the bowl just outside of Wall Street. So that's a, a black, you know, like stone statue outside of Wall Street that a grandma has knit something else to cover. And this very pattern of beauty and all of these things homemade and all of these images that's meant to have people think again. Think again, could we cover this bull with something else? And what is it saying and what is it doing? The yarn bombing movement. I have a good friend, Stacy, who's part of that movement and I love it so much. So that's just a little bit of an intro to Colossians. Just a tiny bit of information there, just a little bit, just to ease our way into this, uh, into this talk. And I think, you know, I really believe, even as I've been preparing for this, I've just been reawakened again, just to imagine things differently. What could it look like even instead of taking a side? What if we just like, you know, turned a, a barrier wall into a playground? You know, this is what the people of God do in the world. They provoke people to think differently. We do it by living differently. This has been a wonderful idea. If Jesus is the Lord of my life, how does it affect what I do or don't do, what I spend or what I don't spend, or how I, who I hang out with and who I don't hang out, what my measurement of success is, what my desire is for my children? I mean, this, this transformative work of Jesus at work is going to challenge our minds. It's going to open the eyes of our hearts, and uh, this is what it is that we're praying for today. This is what it is that we're praying for every day that Jesus would keep awakening us and keep provoking us to live differently in a dark and uh, sometimes very uh, oppressive world. So let's pray this prayer. And uh, if you have uh, questions, by the way, which hopefully you have a lot of, uh, there's a wonderful time in your home church to ask some of those questions and just discuss with each other. What is this? Ah, where's the tension? Where does this? We're not afraid of that tension. This tension is important. And I hope you've heard very clearly that I live in this tension too. It's not like I've got this sorted out. I'm just being invited more and more and more by the Spirit of Christ into the middle of that tension. And what does this mean for us? And how do we wrestle this through together? We're going to need each other to do this, by the way. So your home church is a great way to work out those. If you have questions that you'd like us to discuss at the end of this series, we're going to have a QA and a uh, time, an after party where we discuss the whole series. So send those questions in. They will get to us. We will be praying about them and talking to them at the, uh, about them at the after party series at the end of this series. Okay? Does that sound crystal clear? Okay. So let's pray together. This prayer is actually Colossians again, but it's just taken from the message version. And uh, I'm just going to invite you to take a deep breath and open yourself. Just open. Maybe you need to open your body, posture. Just open your hands. Take a deep breath. Allow the Holy Spirit just to fill you. Not with the peace the world gives, but the peace of Christ. And we'll pray this prayer together. Jesus, you were supreme in the beginning. And leading the resurrection parade, you are supreme in the end. From beginning to end, you are there towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious are you, so expansive, that everything of God finds its proper place in you without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, 
animals and atoms get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of your death, your blood that poured down from the cross. Open our ears. Open our minds. Open our hearts to your power and to your love so we can find our place in you. And all God's people said, amen. Paul, thank you. There it is. There it is, guys. That was, I kept it really simple, Paul, so it'd be super easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing it. That's a great way to pay attention, by the way, everybody, if you're, if you're having troubles, the sketchy, the sketch sermon's great, and it's a beautiful gift. Thank you for it. And uh, we'll use it to help us root this series in, uh, in imagery that might help us uh, carry this on and live this way. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you for having me. And yes, I'll, I'll clean it up. And then, uh, yeah, totally great, great message. You fit so much in there. <laughs> I kept like writing things down and then erasing them and coming back. So uh, definitely we'll listen to this one again. No, thank you so much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here for real. Yeah, thanks, Paul. God bless you. Thanks, everyone. Amen. How awesome is that? I love that idea of engaging our senses, of um, experiencing even the teaching in a new way through imagery. Uh, I'm excited and looking forward to uh, seeing that picture down the road when it's completed. I think that's so good. And how um, awesome was that uh, thought-provoking? Uh, provocative is what Danielle said a lot. And I think that um, yeah, there's just so much, uh, so much good stuff there that um, I know that I will need to process and think about and chat with others. And if that is a place where you find yourself as well, I would encourage you to go to Home Church, um, themeetinghouse.com slash Home Church if you are interested. That's just a place where we can come together, where we can look each other in the face, whether that's online or in person, and ask these questions and wrestle together through these different things that Danielle's been teaching about. Um, today is the day to join a home church. Please do not let another week go by without, le without at least uh, reaching out. And just another reminder that if you do want to be a part of the month of prayer, and again, it too is going to be really awesome, kind of that tangible way to pray together, um, go to themeetinghouse.com slash prayer to sign up. They will send you things. We will send you things, um, whether that's digital resources or actually physical, tangible resources. Um, and come together as a community to pray towards the road of hope as we uh, journey towards Easter. Hey, it has been an awesome time together. Thank you for joining us. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Go in peace. Take care.